Section 13 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 3, Ancient Achievements by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Material Life of the Ancients, Part 2. The ground plan of Alexandria was traced by Alexander himself, but it was not completed until the reign of Ptolemy Philadelphus. Its circumference was about fifteen miles, the streets were regular, and crossed one another at right angles, being wide enough for free passage of both carriages and foot-passengers. Its harbor could hold the largest fleet ever congregated, its walls and gates were constructed with all the skill and strength known to antiquity, its population numbered six hundred thousand, and all nations were represented in its crowded streets. The wealth of the city may be inferred from the fact that in one year sixty-two hundred and fifty talents, or more than six million dollars, were paid to the public treasury for port dues. The library was the largest in the world, numbering over seven hundred thousand volumes, and this was connected with a museum, a menagerie, a botanical garden, and various halls for lectures, altogether forming the most famous university in the Roman Empire. The inhabitants were chiefly Greek, and had all the cultivated tastes and mercantile thrift of that quick-witted people. In a commercial point of view, Alexandria was the most important city in the world, and its ships whitened every sea. Unlike most commercial cities, it was intellectual, and its schools of poetry, mathematics, medicine, philosophy, and theology were more renowned than even those of Athens during the third and fourth centuries. Alexandria, could it have been transported in its former splendor to our modern world, would be a great capital in these times and all these cities were connected with one another and with rome by magnificent roads perfectly straight and paved with large blocks of stone they were originally constructed for military purposes but were used by travellers and on them posts were regularly established they crossed valleys upon arches and penetrated mountains in italy especially they were great works of art and connected all the provinces there was an uninterrupted communication from the wall of antonius through york london sandwich boulogne Reims, Lyon, Milan, Rome, Brundisium, Dyrrachium, Byzantium, Anacria, Tarsus, Antioch, Tyre, Jerusalem. A distance of thirty seven hundred and forty miles, and these roads were divided by milestones and houses for travelers erected upon them at points of every five or six miles. Commerce under the Roman emperors was not what it is now, but was still very considerable and thus united the various provinces together. The most remote countries were ransacked to furnish luxuries for Rome. Every year a fleet of 120 vessels sailed from the Red Sea for the islands of the Indian Ocean. But the Mediterranean, with the rivers which flowed into it, was the great highway of the ancient navigator. Navigation by the ancients was even more rapid than in modern times before the invention of steam, since oars were employed as well as sails. In one summer, 162 Roman miles were sailed over in 24 hours. This was the average speed, or about seven knots. From the mouth of the Tiber, vessels could usually reach Africa in two days, Massilla in three, and the Pillars of Hercules in seven. From Patioli, the passage to Alexandria had been effected, with moderate winds, in nine days. These facts, however, apply only to the summer and to favorable winds. The Romans did not navigate in the inclement seasons, but in summer the great inland sea was white with sails. Great fleets brought corn from Gaul, Spain, Sardinia, Africa, Sicily, and Egypt. This was the most important trade, but a considerable commerce was carried on also in ivory, tortoiseshell, cotton and silk fabrics, pearls and precious stones, gums, spices, wines, wool, and oil. Greek and Asiatic wines, especially the Chian and Lesbian, were in great demand at Rome. The transport of earthenware, made generally in the Grecian cities, of wild animals for the amphitheatre, of marble, of the spoils of eastern cities, of military engines and stores, and of horses, required very large fleets and thousands of mariners, which probably belonged chiefly to great maritime cities. These cities, with their dependencies, required even more vessels for communication with one another than for Rome herself, the great central object of enterprise and cupidity. In this survey of ancient cities I have not yet spoken of the great central city, the city of the seven hills, to which all the world was tributary. Whatever was costly or rare or beautiful, in Greece or Asia or Egypt, was appropriated by her citizen kings, since citizens were provincial governors. All the great highways, from the Atlantic to the Tigris, converged to the capital. 
all roads led to rome all the ships of alexandria and carthage and tarentum and other commercial capitals were employed in furnishing her with luxuries and necessities never was there so proud a city as this epitome of the universe london paris vienna constantinople st petersburg berlin are great centers of fashion and power but they are rivals and excel only in some great department of human enterprise and genius as in letters or fashions or commerce or manufactures centers of influence and power in the countries of which they are capitals yet they do not monopolize the wealth and energies of the world london may contain more people than did ancient rome and may possess more commercial wealth but london represents only the british monarchy not a universal empire rome however monopolized everything and controlled all nations and peoples she could shut up the schools of athens or disperse the ships of alexandria or regulate the shops of antioch what lyon and bordeaux are to paris corinth and babylon were to rome mere dependent cities paul condemned at jerusalem stretched out his arms to rome and rome protected him the philosophers of greece were the tutors of roman nobility the kings of the east resorted to the palaces of mount palatine for favors or safety the governors of syria and egypt reigning in the palaces of ancient kings returned to rome to squander the riches they had accumulated senators and nobles took their turn as sovereign rulers of all the known countries of the world the halls in which darius and alexander and pericles and croesus and solomon and cleopatra had feasted became the witness of the banquets of roman proconsuls babylon thebes and athens were only what delhi and calcutta are to the english of our day cities to be ruled by the delegates of the imperial senate Rome was the only home of the proud governors who reigned on the banks of the Thames, of the Seine, of the Rhine, of the Nile, of the Tigris. After they had enriched themselves with the spoils of the ancient monarchies, they returned to their estates in Italy, or to their palaces on the Aventine. What a concentration of works of art on the hills, and around the Forum, and in the Campus Martius, and other celebrated quarters! There were temples rivaling those of Athens and Ephesus, baths covering more ground than the pyramids surrounded with corinthian columns and filled with the choicest treasures ransacked from the cities of greece and asia palaces in comparison with the tuileries and versailles are small theatres which seated a larger audience than any present public buildings in europe amphitheatres more extensive and costly than cologne milan and york minister cathedrals combined and seating eight times as many spectators as could be crowded into st peter's church circuses where it is said three hundred and eighty five thousand persons could witness the games and chariot races at a time bridges still standing which have furnished models for the most beautiful at paris and london aqueducts carried over arches one hundred feet in height through which flowed the surplus water of distant lakes drains of solid masonry in which large boats could float pillars more than one hundred feet in height coated with precious marbles or plates of brass and covered with bas reliefs obelisks brought from egypt fora and basilicas connected together and extending more than three thousand feet in length every part of which was filled with animated busts of conquerors kings statesmen poets publicists and philosophers mausoleums greater and more splendid than that artemisia erected to the memory of her husband triumphal arches under which marched in stately procession the victorious armies of the eternal city preceded by the spoils and trophies of conquered empires such was the proud capital a city of palaces a residence of nobles who were virtually kings enriched with the accumulated treasures of ancient civilization great were the capitals of greece and asia but how preeminent was rome since all were subordinate to her how bewildering and bewitching to a traveller must have been the varied wonders of the city go where he would his eye rested on something which was both a study and a marvel let him drive or walk about the suburbs there were villas tombs aqueducts looking like our railroads on arches sculptured monuments and gardens of surpassing beauty and luxury let him approach the walls they were great fortifications extending twenty-one miles in circuit according to the measurement of ammon as adopted by gibbon and forty-five miles according to other authorities let him enter any of the various gates that opened into the city from the roads which radiated to all parts of italy and the world they were of monumental brass covered with bas reliefs on which the victories of generals for a thousand years were commemorated let him pass through any of the crowded thoroughfares he saw houses towering scarcely ever less than seventy feet as tall as those in edinburgh in its oldest sections 
most of the houses in which this vast population lived according to strabo possessed pipes which gave a never-failing supply of water from the rivers that flowed into the city through the aqueducts and out again through the sewers into the tiber let the traveller walk up the via sacra the short street scarcely half a mile in length and he passed the flavian amphitheatre the temple of venus and rome the arch of titus the temples of peace of vesta and of castor the forum romanum the basilica julia the arch of severus the temple of saturn and stood before the majestic ascent to the capitoline jupiter with its magnificent portico and ornamented pediment surpassing the facade of any modern church on his left as he emerged from beneath the sculptured arch of titus was the palatine mount nearly covered by the palace of the caesars the magnificent residences of the higher nobility and various temples of which that of apollo was the most magnificent built by augustus of solid white marble from luna here were the palaces of vacus of flaccus of cicero of cataline of scarus of antonius of clodius of agrippa and of hortensius still on his left in the valley between the palatine and the capitoline though he could not see it concealed from view by the great temples of vesta and of castor and the still greater edifice known as the basilica julia was the quarter called the velabrum extending to the river where the pons amelius crossed it a low quarter of narrow streets and tall houses where the rabble lived and died on his right concealed from view by the aedes divi juli and the forum romanum was that magnificent series of edifices extending from the temple of peace to the temple of trajan including the basilica pauli the forum juli the forum augusti the forum trajani the basilica ulpia a space more than three thousand feet in length and six hundred in breadth almost entirely surrounded by porticos and colonnades and filled with statues and pictures displaying on the whole probably the grandest series of public buildings clustered together ever erected especially if we include the forum romanum and the various temples and basilicas which connected the whole a forest of marble pillars and statues ascending the steps which led from the temple of concord to the temple of juno moneta upon the arcs or tarpeian rock on the southwestern summit of the hill itself one of the most beautiful temples in rome erected by camillus on the spot where the house of m manilus capitolinus had stood and one came upon the roman mint near this was the temple erected by augustus to jupiter tonins and that built by domitian to jupiter custos but all the sacred edifices which crowned the capitoline were subordinate to the templum jovis capitolini standing on a platform of eight thousand square feet and built of the richest materials the portico which faced the via sacra consisted of three rows of doric columns the pediment profusely ornamented with the choicest sculptures the apex of the roof surmounted by the bronze horses of lysippus and the roof itself covered with gilded tiles the temple had three separate cells though covered with one roof in front of each stood colossal statues of the three deities to whom it was consecrated here were preserved what was most sacred in the eyes of romans and it was itself the richest of all the temples of the city what a beautiful panorama was presented to the view from the summit of this consecrated hill only mounted by a steep ascent of one hundred steps to the south was the via sacra extending to the Colosseum, and beyond it the appia via lined with monuments as far as the eye could reach a little beyond the fora to the east was the carinae a fashionable quarter of beautiful shops and houses and still farther off were the baths of titus extending from the carinae to the esquiline mount to the northeast were the viminal and quirinal hills after the palatine the most ancient part of the city the seat of the sabine population abounding in fanes and temples the most splendid of which was the temple of quirinius erected originally to romulus by numa but rebuilt by augustus with a double row of columns on each of its sides seventy-six in number nearby was the house of atticus and the gardens of sallust in the valley between the quirinial and pincian afterward the property of the emperor far back on the quirinial near the wall of servius were the baths of diocletian and still farther to the east the praetorian camp established by tiberius and included within the wall of aurelian to the northeast the eye lighted on the pincian hill covered with the gardens of lucullus to possess which messalina caused the death of valerius asiaticus into whose possession they had fallen in the valley which lay between the fora and the quinial was the celebrated sabura 
the quarter of shops markets and artificers a busy noisy vulgar section not beautiful but full of life and enterprise and wickedness the eye then turned north and the whole length of the via flamina was exposed to view extending from the capitoline to the flaminian gate perfectly straight the finest street in rome and a parallel to the modern corso it was the great highway to the north of italy monuments and temples and palaces lined this celebrated street it was spanned by the triumphal arches of claudius and marcus aurelius to the west of it was the campus martius with its innumerable objects of interest the baths of agrippa the pantheon the thermae alexandrinae the column of marcus aurelius and the mausoleum of augustus beneath the capitoline on the west toward the river was the circus flaminius the portico of octavius the theatre of balbus and the theatre of pompeii where forty thousand spectators were accommodated stretching beyond the thermae alexandrae near the pantheon was the magnificent bridge which crossed the tiber built by hadrian when he founded his mausoleum to which it led still standing under the name of the ponte s angelo the eye took in eight or nine bridges over the tiber some of wood but generally of stone of beautiful masonry and crowned with statues in the valley between the palatine and the aventine was the great circus maximus founded by the early tarquin it was the largest open space enclosed by walls and porticos in the city it seated three hundred and eighty five thousand spectators how vast a city which could spare nearly four hundred thousand of its population to see the chariot races beyond was the aventine itself this also was rich in legendary monuments and in the palaces of the great though originally a plebeian quarter here dwelt trajan before he was emperor and ennius the poet and paola the friend of saint jerome beneath the aventine and a little south of the circus maximus were the great baths of caracalla the ruins of which next to those of the Colosseum, made on my mind the strongest impression of all that i saw that pertains to antiquity though these were not so large as those of diocletian the view south took in the caelian hill the ancient residence of tullus hostilis this hill was the residence of many distinguished romans among whose palaces was that of claudius centumalus which towered ten or twelve stories into the air but grander than any of these palaces was that of placius lateranus on whose site now stands the basilica of st john lateran the gift of constantine to the bishop of rome one of the most ancient of the christian churches in which for fifteen hundred years daily services have been performed such were the objects of interest and grandeur that met the eye as it was turned toward the various quarters of the city which contained between three and four millions of people lipsius estimates four millions as the population including slaves women children and strangers though this estimate is regarded as too large by merivale and others yet how enormous must have been the number of the people when there were nine thousand and twenty-five baths and when those of diocletian could accommodate thirty-two hundred bathers at a time the wooden theatre of scarus contained eighty thousand seats that of marcellus twenty thousand the Colosseum would seat eighty seven thousand persons and give standing space for twenty two thousand more the circus maximus would hold three hundred and eighty five thousand spectators if only one person out of four of the free population witnessed the games and spectacles at a time we thus must have four millions of people altogether in the city the aurelian walls are now only thirteen miles in circumference but lipsius estimates the original circumference at forty-five miles and vopiscus at nearly fifty the diameter of the city must have been eleven miles since strabo tells us that the actual limit of rome was at a place between the fifth and sixth milestone from the column of trajan in the forum the central and most conspicuous object in the city except the capital modern writers taking london and paris for their measure of material civilization seem unwilling to admit that rome could have reached such a pitch of glory and wealth and power to him who stands within the narrow limits of the forum as it now appears it seems incredible that it could have been the centre of a much larger city than europe can now boast of grave historians are loath to compromise their dignity and character for truth by admitting statements which seem to men of limited views to be fabulous and which transcend modern experience but we should remember that most of the monuments of ancient rome have entirely disappeared nothing remains of the palace of the caesars which nearly covered the palatine hill little of the fora which connected together covered a space twice as large as that enclosed by the palaces of the louvre and the tuileries with all their galleries and courts almost nothing of the glories of the capitoline hill and little comparatively of those thermae which were a mile in circuit but what does remain attests an unparalleled grandeur the broken pillars of the forum 
the lofty columns of Trajan and Marcus Aurelius, the Pantheon lifting its spacious dome two hundred feet in the air, the mere vestibule of the baths of Agrippa, the triumphal arches of Titus and Trajan and Constantine, the bridges which span the Tiber, the aqueducts which cross the Campania, the Cloaca Maxima which drained the marshes and lakes of the infant city, and above all the Colosseum. What glory and shame are associated with that single edifice! That alone, if nothing else remained of pagan antiquity, would indicate a grandeur and a folly such as cannot now be seen on earth. It reveals a wonderful skill in masonry and great architectural strength. It shows the wealth and resources of rulers who must have had the treasures of the world at their command. It shows the restless passions of the people for excitement, and the necessity on the part of the government of yielding to this taste. What leisure and indolence marked a city which could afford to give up so much time to demoralizing sports! What facilities for transportation were afforded when so many wild beasts could be brought to the capital from the central parts of Africa without calling out unusual comment! How imperious a populace that compels the government to provide such expensive pleasures! The games of Titus on the dedication of the Colosseum lasted one hundred days, and five thousand wild beasts were slaughtered in the arena. The number of the gladiators who fought surpasses belief. At the triumph of Trajan over the Dacians, ten thousand gladiators were exhibited, and the emperor himself presided under a gilded canopy, surrounded by thousands of his lords. Underneath the arena, strewed with yellow sand and stardust, was a solid pavement, so closely cemented that it could be turned into an artificial lake on which naval battles were fought. But it was the conflict of gladiators which most deeply stimulated the passions of the people. The benches were crowded with eager spectators, and the voices of one hundred thousand were raised in triumph or rage as the miserable victims sank exhausted in the bloody sport. Yet it was not the gladiatorial sports of the amphitheatre which most strikingly attested the greatness and splendour of the city, nor the palaces, in which as many as four hundred slaves were sometimes maintained as domestic servants for a single establishment, twelve hundred in number according to the lowest estimate, but probably five times as numerous, since every senator, every knight, and every rich man was proud to possess a residence which would attract attention. Nor the temples, which numbered four hundred and twenty-four, most of which were of marble, filled with statues, the contributions of ages, and surrounded with groves, nor the fora and basilicas, with their porticos, statues, and pictures, covering more space than any cluster of public buildings in Europe, a mile and a half in circuit, nor the baths, nearly as large, still more completely filled with works of art, nor the Circus Maximus, where more people witnessed the chariot races at a time that are nightly assembled in all the places of public amusement in Paris, London, and New York combined, more than could be seated in all the cathedrals of England and France. It is not these which most impressively make us feel the amazing grandeur of the old capital of the world. The triumphal processions of the conquering generals were still more exciting to behold, for these appealed more directly to the imagination, and excited those passions which urged the Romans to a career of conquest from generation to generation. No military review of modern times equaled those gorgeous triumphs, even as no scenic performance compares with the gladiatorial shows. The sun has never shone upon any human assemblage so magnificent and so grand, so imposing and yet so guilty. Not only were displayed the spoils of conquered kingdoms, and the triumphal cars of generals, but the whole military strength of the capital, an army of one hundred thousand men flushed with victory, followed the gorgeous procession of nobles and princes. The triumph of Aurelian on his return from the east gives us some idea of the grandeur of that ovation to the conquerors. The pomp was opened by twenty elephants, four royal tigers, and two hundred of the most curious animals from every climate, north, south, east, and west. These were followed by sixteen hundred gladiators, devoted to the cruel amusement of the amphitheatre. Then were displayed the arms and ensigns of conquered nations, the plate and wardrobe of the Syrian queen. Then ambassadors from all parts of the earth, all remarkable in their rich dresses with their crowns and offerings. Then the captives taken in the various wars, Goths, Vandals, Samaritans, Alemanni, Franks, Gauls, Syrians, and Egyptians, each marked by their national costume. Then the Queen of the East, the beautiful Zenobia, confined by fetters of gold and fainting under the weight of jewels, preceding the beautiful chariot in which she had hoped to enter the gates of Rome. Then the chariot of the Persian king. Then the triumphal car of Aurelian himself, drawn by elephants. Finally, the most illustrious of the Senate and the army closed the solemn procession, amid the acclamations of the people and the sound of musical instruments. 
it took from dawn of the day until the ninth hour for the procession to pass to the capital and the festival was protracted by theatrical representations the games of the circus the hunting of wild beasts combats of gladiators and naval engagements such were the material wonders of the ancient civilizations culminating in their latest and greatest representative and displayed in its proud capital nearly all of which became later the spoil of barbarians who ruthlessly marched over the classic world having no regard for its choicest treasures those old glories are now indeed succeeded by a prouder civilization the work of nobler races after sixteen hundred years of new experiments but why such an eclipse of the glory of man the reason is apparent if we survey the internal state of the ancient empires especially of society as it existed under the roman emperors authorities herodotus strabo pliny polybius diodorus siclius titus livius pausanias on the geography and resources of the ancient nations see an able chapter on mediterranean prosperity in louis napoleon's history of caesar smith's dictionary of ancient geography is exhaustive wilkinson has revealed the civilization of ancient egypt professor becker's handbook of rome as well as his gallus and chericles shed much light on manners and customs dyer's history of the city of rome is the fullest description of its wonders that i have read niebuhr bunsen and platner among the germans have written learnedly but also have created much doubt about things supposed to be established Momsen, curticus and merivale are also great authorities nor are the magnificent chapters of gibbon to be disregarded by the student of roman history notwithstanding his elaborate and inflated style end of section thirteen